Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I was just going over the Jeopardy champions and I think Colby, I don't think you're in here yet because I had made this list before you joined the class. So just give me one second to update this. All right, so here's what we are going to do today. Um, today, we are going to continue with this lecture. We'll see as far as we get. Um, it's possible we could finish this lecture early, in which case we wouldn't have class on Friday. I don't know if we can do all that. Um, what's more realistic is that we get most of the way through the lecture today, and then Friday will be a short class. Um, either way, we'll, we will be taking our second quiz on Friday. And um, so it looks like right now I just uh, redid the Jeopardy sheet. Um, so we're going to have Colby and Aiden take play Jeopardy on Monday morning, which means you two would not take the quiz online over the weekend. Um, and then you'll just do it live if that works for everybody. Um, all right. Do we have any questions before we begin? No is the quiz cumulative or is it just on this uh, part? I'm sorry. I Hold on. Let me turn the volume on. Go ahead. Is the quiz uh, cumulative? So would it be like stuff that was from the last quiz as well? Or is it just what we've learned since then and like what's in the textbook for this part? No, it's just it's just uh, lecture two and chapter two. So okay. each week, the quiz questions will be derived from the information from that week. All right. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Let me pull the lecture up. Oops. Wrong lecture. Okay. All right. So this week we are talking about crime stats, how we count crime, and we covered how we count crime on Monday. So just a quick uh, review. There are basically two ways that we do it in our country. We have the Uniform Crime Report, which is compiled by the FBI. And um, due to some of the problems that we had with the reliability of the data, we now use a different submission form. So the National Incident-Based Reporting System still becomes part of the UCR crime report. It's just imagine there were two different forms you could fill out, the UCR form or the NIBRS form. And starting January 1st of this year, the FBI no longer accepts the old UCR form. They now only accept the NIBRS form, which is just a lot more detail. So remember, NIBRS, UCR NIBRS are reported crimes in the US and each police department reports their, uh, sends their monthly stats uh, versus the National Crime Victimization Survey in which Census Bureau personnel go to uh, selected households about 43,000 a year. Um, and they go twice a year and ask them if they've been the victim of the crime. So the National Crime Victimization Survey can get at the dark figure of crime, which is unreported crime, and the UCR NIBRS deals with reported crime. So a lot of times we will compare those two reports uh, when we're looking to see what the crime rate looks like in our nation. So then we went over some violent crime trends and you can see um, that it has been a bit of a decrease, even though there was a slight increase between uh, 2016 and 2017, the overall trend is going down. Um, and things to note is that murder accounted for a very small percentage of all violent crimes. So now what we're gonna start doing is going through all of the part one crimes for the UCR report, and we're gonna start with murder. So. Murder defined by UCR NIBRS is the willful non-negligent killing of one human being by another. And the statistics are gathered in what is called the supplementary homicide report. So if you wanted homicide, if you wanted homicide stats for the nation, when you go on the UCR website, you click on the SHR, which is the supplementary homicide report. And included in this are 
um, all counts of non-negligent manslaughter that have been reported to or discovered by the police. So things that are not included in this are things like suicides or justifiable homicides. Who knows an example of a justifiable homicide? What am I talking about? Like, like stand your ground laws in like South Carolina and stuff like that and property, there's property laws that like allow you to shoot people if you but for, if they're in certain, if they're facing you and like, there's a bunch of little nuances to it, but yeah. Right. That's a very specific example in general. What I mean is any sort of self-defense. So if it's self-defense, it's not counted in the supplementary homicide report. This report is referring to good old fashioned murder. So we're not talking suicide. We're not talking justifiable, which is like self-defense, um, death caused by negligence or accidents. So um, if you are uh, convicted of involuntary manslaughter, it's not gonna count right there. So any sort of negligence, um, we are looking for willful murder, right? So if there is some sort of car crash, um, a, a good example, we'll go over this later in the semester, but like, for instance, if you're driving and you have a seizure and you crash your car and kill someone, that's a negligent killing that would not be counted because it's not willful, it has to be you meant to do this, this is what we're counting here. The last thing that is not included here are attempted murders. So what do you think an attempted murder is counted as? What sort of crime are we talking about here? Aggravated assault. Exactly, right? So most states have a statute for attempted murder, but for UCR NIBRS, they're including that as an aggravated assault. So if you're one of those uh, analysts in a police department, you got to pull all your attempted murders and count them as aggravated assaults for UCR NIBRS purposes. All right, so let's go through murder stats for our nation. Again, I am never going to ask you um, specific numbers. I just want you to kind of get an understanding of what we're talking about here. So like I mentioned before, all UCR NIBR stats are going to be several years old because it takes that long to compile them and to make sure there are no mistakes and get, you know, find missing data, so on and so forth. Um, so we're looking at 2019 statistics. There are preliminary 2020 statistics, but basically it would only show us like the rate. All this other additional stuff is not compiled yet for 2020. So looking at 2019, there was an estimated 16,425 murders that the police knew about that were considered a, a homicide here. So a willful non-negligent killing. So this makes the murder rate about five per 100,000 in our nation. So the murder rate, most like other crimes has been decreasing since the mid nineties. And if we look at the type of murder victim. So the type of person that is likely to be murdered in our country, 78% of them were male, 54% were black, 42% were white, and about 16% were Hispanic or Latino. So basically what I'm saying here is um, if you're a male, watch out. Um, you are much more likely to be murdered than a female. Um, and when we're looking at race, it looks like it's evenly split, right? So we've got like 54% black versus 42% white. But what you have to remember is that it's not a 50-50 split of white and Caucasian through our nation. So minorities only make up, I think African-Americans make up about 13% of our population, um, yet 54% of them were murdered. So even though that percentage looks like it's kind of evenly split, you have to remember that's not the distribution of our uh, of, a, of race in our country. So let's talk about how people were murdered. So 74% of our homicide victims in 2019 were killed with a firearm. That stat has not changed in like a century pretty much. Um, so this is followed by, so firearms are about 74%. This was followed by uh, blunt objects. Uh, followed by knives, and then personal weapons, which would be like hands, fists, feet, so on and so forth. So um, firearm is by far the most likely reason why someone was murdered in our country. So let's talk about the region of where homicides take place. So who can guess the region where there were the most homicides in 2019? Where do we think that happened? 
Northeast. Wait, hold on. Kenya's, where'd you say? I said Northeast. Mm, nope. Tristan? Midwest. No. Oh, come on, you guys. Who's got the most guns? The South. Oh, yeah. It's the South. First of all, we have a lot of guns here, but also for some reason, murder seems to peak in the hot weather, in the hot months. Um, and so we are much warmer down here in the South. So something about being hot and having access to a lot of guns means lots of murder victims. So most of the murder victims uh, to, or most of the murders took place here in the South. Ma'am, I got a question. Yeah, what's up? So do you think that number could go up for like murders that haven't been like discovered yet? Like the percentage go up barely? So usually what that is captured is in the next year. Okay. Yeah. So um, like, are you wondering if, like if, so for instance, if we saw a huge spike in 2020, is that because they just hadn't solved them or hadn't found the body yet in 2019? Is that what you're asking? Yes, ma'am. It's unlikely. Usually it kind of evens itself out. So the victims that they didn't find in 2019, they found in 2020. Those that they didn't find in 2020, they find in 2021. Okay. Generally, it's not. It's not. It's not that. Yes, ma'am. It's, it's actually uh, fairly difficult to hide a body um, because of the gases. Wherever you send it, usually it will float to the top. And because of weather, it eventually we find it. It's a very small percentage of bodies that are never found. All right, so let's talk about who's murdering who. So roughly 10% of murder victims were killed by a stranger. 20% uh, were killed by someone that they knew and 13% were killed by family members. So that makes acquaintance murder the most common form of murder. So that scary murder where like a stranger murders you is pretty rare. That only happens about 10% of the time. Most of the time, the murder victims know their, their attacker. That is the most common. If you're going to be murdered, chances are you're a male and chances are you know the person that murdered you and you were killed with a firearm. That's the most common type in this nation. And just like I said before, generally murder rates will peak in the summer months. So um, let's see, we see, um, we see that uh, the greatest murders occurred in August in 2019. All right, so let's talk about clearance rate. So clearance rate is always listed in the UCR NIBR statistics. So for murders, 61.4% of them were cleared in 2019. So how we define clearance is really what's important here. So for a UCR NIBRS purposes, a clearance rate to be cleared, it just means that the police made an arrest and they were charged and turned over the prosecution. So in 2019, in 61% of the homicide cases, there was an arrest made. What happens after that arrest is not included in UCR NIBR staff. So we don't know what percentage of them were actually convicted and served time. So whenever you're seeing a clearance rate for UCR NIBRs, that just means the police made an arrest and turned it over to the prosecutor. 10 seconds later, the prosecutor could have dismissed the charges, but we will still count that as a cleared homicide for UCR NIBRs. So that means it's almost like 40% uh, chance that they won't find a killer? 40% chance they won't make an arrest during this reporting period. Oh, okay. Okay, I got you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's murder. We got any questions on murder? Okay. Let's move right along to more violent crimes. So forcible rape. So something that's really important to note about this is that it went it underwent a definition change in 2013. So whenever you change the definition of something that you're counting, you cannot compare the rates before and after that definition change because if you do, it will look like an artificial inflation or deflation because you're just counting things differently. So let me get, let you get that down and I'll elaborate a little bit more. 
this is what we refer to as an instrumentation threat to validity. So let me break that down. The reason it's an instrumentation threat is because we're referring to the survey instrument, right? So what we are counting as a forcible rate is on that survey instrument. And when we change that definition of what we count, that is a threat to the validity of the study. So basically what happened in 2013, they, um, they changed the definition in several ways. First of all, they started counting males. So prior to 2013, they were not counting males. And secondly, they considered any, it, it didn't have to be a sex organ. It could be penetration by anything. So when you are increasing the number of victims and increasing what we're counting as a rate, if we try to compare the rape rates from before 2013 until 20 after, it's gonna look like there was an increase when in reality, we just were counting more people as being uh, raped within this period. So whenever, if for some reason you need to compare the rape rates, you cannot compare anything before 2013 and anything after because of this instrumentation threat to validity. So my best suggestion is to use stats from 2013 moving forward. If you're trying to see trends, like you can't compare trends before and after 2013 because we changed the definition. So yeah. like if you were to be like doing like a research paper or such like regarding that, like how would you like explain the like, would you just say exactly what you just said that like there's a difference? Yeah, so either, so depending on the scope of your paper, if it's possible, I would only talk about 2013 moving forward. If you wanna talk about the, the rates beyond, you are gonna wanna look at everything from like 1920 to 2013, and then separately 2013 to, to present because you can't compare the two. Were, uh, were males counted in a separate thing or was that just not a thing they looked at? They just didn't count it. <clears throat> it's pretty rare for a male to report a rape anyways, but it does happen. And I mean, it, it happens probably more frequently than you would realize. Um, what happens a lot, and this, this is any reporting of any rape, Sometimes the victim will start to report it and get so traumatized by the experience, they stop it and then it won't get counted because they, they had to close the file. They couldn't, they couldn't move forward. The victim wasn't cooperating. There wasn't enough evidence. But if you just, just that small thing, just, just counting male rapes, if you, if you tried to compare before and after, it's gonna look like the rape rate went up when in reality, it was just this instrumentation threat to validity. So is this only uh, reported or is like convicted? These are reported only. Okay, Remember, so we, can't, we can't tell anything about convictions. The last thing UCR Nibers knows is clearance, which is, did we make an arrest and move to the prosecutor? Okay, so like, I, I don't mean to like offend anyone, but like uh, the, I think it was a high school kid up in North Carolina that got convicted or not convicted, but like reports said that he raped like 23 girls, but like it was wrongfully like, like none of them had any evidence because he never went to those states or out of the country. So like, would that still go into like a report? It would because an arrest was made, but I can see where you're going with this, that the rape rates might appear, appear inflated. This, what you were describing is exceedingly rare. If you think about what a victim has to go through to actually make this happen, it's not a pleasant experience. If a victim's coming forward, it's highly unlikely they're lying about it because they know what the shit storm that's about to hit them in terms of what happens to their reputation. So false rapes, uh, false rape accusations are very rare, but when they do happen, they hit the media like a wild storm because it's a rare instance. So like that, I don't know if you guys remember that Duke lacrosse case, um, is that sounding familiar to anybody where, yeah, that was such a big deal, not only because it was very rare, but also the district attorney, uh, Nifong, was like dealing with all kinds of prosecutorial misconduct. He was like hiding evidence. Again, 
these, this, it hit the media because both of those things are really, really rare. All right, so let's talk about some of the stats. So um, in 2019, there was an estimated 139,815 rapes, which makes the rate about 46 per 100,000. Um, and since we can only compare 2013 and beyond, um, it's actually been steadily increasing just ever so slightly. Um, but we finally saw a slight decrease from 2018 to 2019. So this crime is the least reported of all violent crimes. Um, estimates are that only one in four forcible rapes is reported to the police. Um, and the victim's fear of embarrassment is cited as the number one reason um, why they don't want to report. Um, like I mentioned the other day, in the past, uh, reports of rapes were ha handled in ways that made the victim re-traumatized and very uncomfortable. Um, and so even if they can get past all the questions that all these officers are asking them, the next step is an examination. So imagine being traumatized in that way and then having to go to a hospital and have them basically pry you open and examine you. That is really horrifying for the victim. And then fast forward for another year of trying to go to trial and depositions and testifying, it's not a pleasant experience. And I'm not even talking about if the media catches wind of this, if it's a high profile male that you are accusing, it's not, the media is not gonna treat the victim very well. They rarely do. So because of that, only about a quarter of all rapes are reported. So we see here that the clearance rate is about 32.9%, so just under 33%. Um, this is probably because a lot of victims sort of drop out throughout the way because it's such a horrifying experience for them. Um, so statistically speaking, just like murder, acquaintance rape is the most common type. So if you're gonna be raped, chances are you know the person that did it to you. Um, and partially why we think this is so high is because um, of the use of rohypnol. So date rape is also part of this, will fit into this definition. So that is usually an acquaintance rape. So um, this appears to be a lot more common than we realized. Um, rohypnol had a lot to do with this. And once we started using the NIBRS report that was asking for all this extra information, we were realizing that acquaintance rape appeared to be so high because of the use of rohypnol with date raping. And rohypnol, I assume we all know what rohypnol is. Yeah, we got that. Okay. All right. Questions about this before we start talking about robbery. All right. Okay, so. Let's start by breaking down the difference between robbery and burglary. I have a lot of students, or just not even students, so the general population gets these confused a lot. So the easiest way to understand the difference between robbery and burglary, robbery is a personal crime, meaning something somebody is physically taking something from you. Burglary is a property crime where you are trespassing with the intent to steal. Robbery means someone is physically taking something from you. Burglary means they have broken into a structure, they're trespassing and they want to steal. So robbery is a personal crime involving a face-to-face -face confrontation between the victim and the perpetrator as defined by the UCR as the taking or attempting to take anything of value from care, from the care or custody of a person or persons by force violence and or putting the victim in fear. So robbery and burglary are both considered part one offenses, but things like um, uh, pickpocketing or purse snatching. So even though pickpocketing and purse snatching are generally something would seem like a robbery because it's a face-to-face -face personal crime, both of those purse snatching and pickpocketing are considered larceny thefts by UCR NIBRS purposes. So a robbery, so if, if someone pickpockets you or snatches your purse, 
usually it's not considered a robbery because a robbery is considered a violent crime. Like something, somebody has to like physically frighten you, stick a gun in your face, injure you and take something. If anybody's ever been pickpocketed, the best pickpockets, you don't even realize you've been pickpocketed until you reach for your wallet or your phone, right? So that doesn't usually involve a violent confrontation. Same with a purse snatch. They are running by you, they grab your purse and they run, right? So pickpocketing and purse snatching are considered larceny thefts for UCR NIBRS purposes. When they're talking about a robbery, they mean like a violent face-to-face -face confrontation. All right, so let's talk about stats from last or two years ago, really. So nationwide, there were about uh, just under 300,000 robberies, which is still continuing with a decreasing trend. And so that makes the robbery rate about 81.6 per 100,000 in our nation. Um, collectively, through robbery victims, it's estimated that there was about $482 million in losses. So this means the average loss, if you're robbed on average, you're going to lose about $1,700. So if you're robbed, why do you think the price is that high? What does everybody have on them? That's almost $1,000. Phones on. Yep. Yep. Your iPhone costs about $1,000. So plus any, anything in your wallet, plus any jewelry, the average is about $1,700. All right. So we got three different types of robbery. There's armed robbery, strong armed robbery, or highway robbery. So armed versus strong, a uh, strong arm. So an armed robbery means that they actually had a gun, right? Or any sort of weapon. It could be a pipe, it could be uh, a knife, it could be a gun, but it's a weapon. Strong-armed means they just put you in fear, right? So they backed you into a corner of a dark alley and they made you scared and you handed over your things or maybe pretended to have a gun or, or alluded to the fact that they might have a weapon. But armed versus strong-armed, strong-armed means that they just put you in fear. Arms mean, armed means they actually had a weapon and were brandishing it. So a highway robbery can be either armed or strong armed. A highway robbery just means it happened outdoors in a public place. So highway robberies were the most common. This was followed by um, like um, miscellaneous locations like um, a gas station or a, um, ATM vestibule. Uh, convenience stores, all of those are robberies, but most robberies were highway, meaning it took place outside on the streets. So can you be convicted of like armed robbery and highway robbery or so would that be like double just, jeopardy? So remember, these are just classifications of, um, of how UCR NIBRS classifies them. But as far as what you're charged with, it's unlikely that they give a shit about highway versus not. Arm versus strong will probably put you in the, um, uh, will either make it like a first or a second degree robbery, or a state might call it armed robbery. So, but, but for UCR NIBRS purposes, that's the only reason that they care where it took place, just because police can use that information, right? If most robberies are, like if we found that most of them were hap happening at like ATM vestibules, we might want to make sure patrol officers were hanging out there, you know, something like that. That's just for us as researchers to help. But remember, any of these things are rarely the same exact thing as what you're going to be charged with in your state. Your state does things differently. These are just UCR NIBRS categorization. So in our state, we have um, first and second degree robbery, and there are differences between them. So for robbery, most people that convict or are uh, arrested for this crime are young minority males. And that is um, also robbery is primarily an urban offense. So if you look at the rates for living in a city versus living in the country, it's much more likely, you're much more likely to be robbed in a city compared to a rural county.
And we got a pretty low rate here. Most robberies happen really quickly. The clearance rate is only 30%. A lot of times they do it in a way where it's really hard to identify them. They don't get a good look. They're wearing a mask. They do it in a dark corner. It's, it's hard to catch these guys. They've got gloves. They don't touch anything where they could leave a fingerprint or DNA. It's, it, these are hard cases to crack. All right, questions about this before we start talking about aggravated assault. Can you go over the difference between burglary and robbery again, please? Yes, and we're gonna have a slide on burglary too. But the easiest way to remember it is that burglar, um, a robbery is a personal crime and burglary is a property crime. So a lot of times, if your house is broken into, you will hear people incorrectly saying I was robbed. That's wrong. You were burglarized, your home was burglarized, right? Robbery is a violent face-to-face -face confrontation. Burglary, the definition is trespassing with the intent to steal. You have broken, even if you don't break in, even if you leave your door unlocked and walk in and steal something, that's burglary. Okay, so it could be like someone could steal, walk into my house and steal a TV and that'd be burglary. And then if I was walking and someone stole my phone, that'd be robbery. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, let's talk about aggravated assault. So the unlawful intentional attack by one person upon another for the purpose of inflicting severe or aggravated bodily injury that is how the UCR NIBRS defines an aggravated assault. So there are two ways that assaults are categorized by UCR NIBRS. It can be an aggravated assault, which is a part one offense, or a simple assault, which is a part two offense. The part one offenses are the serious ones. The part two are the least serious ones. So UCR NIBRS classifies them either as aggravated or simple, it's up to your state how they classify it, right? So in this state, actually, let me see if I still got it pulled up. I don't. Hold on, let me just look. I was showing this to my corrections class uh, today. Let me just pull this up and I'll show you. So here are the laws, and these are um, all the violent crimes in our nation or in South Carolina. So let me let me find it. Uh, this is they're starting with murder. Let me just get down to aggravated assault. So if you look right here, we have a statute for attempted murder. So you can be charged with attempted murder, but for UCR purposes, they consider that an aggravated assault. And look at the, all the different types of murder we have. We have manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter, so on and so forth. Administering or attempting to administer poison. <clears throat> Where's the, nope, oh, we got lynching. They were supposed to change that. They were supposed to get rid of that word. Hazing. All right, here we go. So we have several types of assault and they are broken down by whether you commit great bodily injury, moderate bodily injury, and also if you are, if they're including criminal sexual conduct in here, so they have to describe this word as well. So here they have a person, in this state, we have um, assault and battery of a high and aggravated nature. That's what we call it. And here is what you have to do. You have to uh, have great bodily injury to another person or the act is accomplished by means likely to produce death or great bodily injury. And if you're uh, found guilty of that, you get 20 years. Um, so basically we have several different types of aggravated assault and it's up to the police departments to go through and see which of those count as a UCR NIBRS aggravated assault and they count all of those. Um, so do you know that chart that we went over like a couple classes ago where it, like um, they show like how much time you'll get mm -hmm. is so that's like a federal thing, right? That's not like state by state. Some states have it, some states don't, and the federal government has it too. 
So these are just the laws, but that presumptive sentencing guidelines, we also have those. So you see how it says up to 20 years. It's those guidelines that help the judges determine which they get. All right. Let me get back to this. Okay. All right. So simple assaults, um, it, if you look through your textbook, it describes more. So we're just going over the part one offenses in lecture, but your, your textbook goes over all the part two offenses. Simple assault is a part two offense. This usually involves things like pushing and shoving. Um, sometimes simple bar fights, you know, one person is punched, that's the end of it. That's usually a simple assault. Whereas aggravated assaults usually have some sort of weapon involved, or like we saw with South Carolina, they uh, led to great bodily injury. Um, so um, like, like I said, usually aggravated assaults are using a weapon um, or the victim needed medical assistance. So for our purposes, for uh, you, um, South Carolina statutes, it looks like those first two of the aggravated assaults would fall into what the UCR NIBRS is, is looking for. So like I said, while aggravated and simple assaults are the terms that are used for UCR NIBRS, states can call them whatever they want. So our state had several, two different types of aggravated assaults. Some states will call it assault of the first degree, assault of second degree, so on and so forth. So let's look at the stats. So in 2019, there was um, just over 800,000 assaults in the US, which makes the rate about 250 per 100,000. Um, we are also seeing a decrease from 2010. And um, much like rape um, and murder, assault reports were most frequently reported in the summer months. So something about the heat really makes people a lot more violent. So we see aggravated assaults, rapes, and murders the, the biggest ones are, we see an increase during those summer months. So um, we see the least reported aggravated result, assaults in November, December, January, and February. And then the summer months is when we sort of see a spike with these. So most aggravated assaults were committed with a blunt object or an object near at hand. So thinking about that, and then let's look at the next stat. And we also see that most aggravated assaults are done between acquaintances. So just like murder and rape, you're most likely to know your attacker. So if we see that a blunt object in an, or an object near at hand and acquaintances make up the most types of aggravated assault, what sort of assault do you think we're talking about here? Any ideas? Can you repeat the question, please? So looking at these two stats right here, the fact that most aggravated assaults um, are committed with a blunt object or an object near at hand, and that they the most of the victims and offenders know each other, what sort of crime is that sounding like? Domestic. Oh, say that again. Domestic crime. Exactly. This looks like a lot of domestic violence incidents. First of all, they obviously know each other. Second of all, it looks like kind of a crime of passion where maybe they just grab the closest thing at hand and bash someone over the head. So based on these two stats, researchers are thinking this has a lot to do with domestic violence incidents. So most aggravated assaults are blunt objects, objects close at hand. This is followed by um, hands, feet, and fists. Then knives and firearms are the also uh, pretty low on that list. So why do we think firearms aren't higher with aggravated assaults? Because there are probably the, the firearms involved with murder. Yeah, exactly. So good point, guys. So um, and also because we see that the um, most aggravated assault victims know their aggressor. And given the fact that they're an assault victim and not a murder victim means they are still living, this is probably why we see a pretty high clearance rate here, right? They knew them and they're living to tell the tale. All right, 
So I don't think we're going to get all the way through the slides. I'm sorry. I tried. Um, so what we have next, let's just go over the property crime trends. And then on Friday, we'll finish up. Uh, we'll do burglary, larceny theft, motor vehicle theft, and arson. Okay. All right. So looking at the property crime trends, you can see that there were 6.9 million property offenses in 26, uh, 2019, making the rate about 2,000 or 2,100 per 100,000. So remember I was telling you that property crimes are a lot more common than violent crimes. If we see these numbers and compare them to the violent crimes, 1.2366. So it's pretty apparent the property crimes are a lot more common than violent crimes. So that's a common misconception. Property crimes are a lot more common in our nation than violent crimes. Violent crimes are pretty rare. So when we're looking at the types of property crimes, larceny theft accounts for most property crimes. So when we look at property crimes, we're thinking burglary, uh, larceny, motor vehicle theft. Those are the big ones. Of them, larceny theft is the most common. And what we're seeing here is we, our nation lost about $15.8 billion as a result of property crimes in 2019. And just like I've been saying with all the other crimes, you can clearly see a decline over the last several years. All right, questions about this? No questions? All right, so on Friday, we'll go over burglary, larceny theft, and motor vehicle theft, which make up the uh, three big property crimes. And then we'll also cover arson as well. All right, I will see everybody on Friday and we'll uh, remind who's taking the quiz then, but I believe it was Colby and Aiden. Um, so just keep that in mind that you'll be taking that live uh, on Monday morning. All right, any questions? Okie dokie. See everybody on Friday.